John Fitzgerald Kennedy is, of course, one of the busiest men in the country today. But he managed to find time on a rare day off from campaigning for us to visit with him, his wife Jacqueline, and their little daughter Caroline. Along with their summer home in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, the well-known Kennedy family colony, Senator and Mrs. John Kennedy maintain this home in Washington, D.C. It's a comfortable 18th century red brick house in the historic Georgetown section. Hello, Mrs. Kennedy. Hello, Charles. According to several hundred well-informed sources, your husband is spending the day between airplanes and speeches at home for a change. Yes, he's home today, and it's marvelous to have him here. If you'll be with me for a few minutes, he'll join us soon. Well, the senator is very thoughtful. I'm delighted to bear with you for as long as the whole afternoon. You know, it's been said by people who know you fairly well, though, that you're a basically shy person. Has the change in the circumstances in your life since Senator Kennedy was nominated in July been painful or difficult for you? Well, I think the major change in my life was the first year I got married, where instead of like most young brides who have a husband with a nine-to-five job, I married a whirlwind and had to adjust to a very hectic life. So I did all the adjusting then. Now it's just increased a little, but I'm used to it. And I suppose sometimes it's sort of fun, isn't it? Well, it is. Seldom does a lady have to face the deluge of international attention that uh, the, the wife of a candidate for the presidency does. Does this mean a tremendous adjustment for you? Well, it is rather strange to find oneself the focus of so much attention, but I'm very grateful, uh, and it doesn't bother me in any way, because people are very kind to my husband. I'm delighted for, uh, with their interest in him. And after all, the main thing I'm interested in, in, in is his winning in November. So uh, any effort or inconvenience it causes is only a pleasure. As an expert on the subject, tell me this. Does it take a special kind of woman, a special psychology, personality, to be married to a politician, especially a presidential candidate? Well, I suppose the most important thing she needs is to really love her husband then any sacrifices or adjustments she has to make are only a joy. Well, now there's a reasonable possibility that uh, you and Senator Kennedy may be provided with other housing in Washington and may have to move away from this fine old Georgetown house. How long has this been your Washington home? It's been our home for three years. Uh, Jack bought it when I was in the hospital having Caroline. We brought her home here and painted around ourselves for a year. And we've been here, she's been with us ever since we've been in this house, which is one reason I love it so much. Well, the way you have it decorated, it certainly is in the finest tradition of Georgetown. Yes, well, Jack loves old things, and he picked it because it's rather historic looking from the outside. I have it filled with some 18th century furniture, which I love, my pictures, my drawings, which I collect. He's been very nice about letting me do the inside, but uh, I haven't made it completely all my own because I never want a house where you have to say to your children, don't touch, or where your husband isn't comfortable. And uh, though there are lots of little things like this around, there are also big comfortable chairs and the tables that every politician needs next to his chair where he can put papers, coffee cups, ashtrays. So it's a little bit of everything. Well, it is a lovely house. I'm sure, Mrs. Kennedy, that you've given some thought to the awesome task of running the White House. Uh, well, I have given some, but I think it's a mistake to cross bridges before you come to them. I also think the White House is equipped with an established and trained staff. It has to be. So in many ways, young mothers like myself who have to run two houses if your husband is in Congress, plus keep up with a lot of traveling with the very little help it's possible to get nowadays. I've just as hard a job as running the White House. What do you say should be the major role of the First Lady? Well, I think the major role of the First Lady is to take care of the President so he can best serve the people and to not fail her family, her husband and her children. And what about the official duties, the social responsibilities? 
Well, of course, she can't expect to be a completely private person. She will have a, an official role, which she must play and accept with grace. But I think there's so much she can do, things she cares about, she can help. In my case, it would be education, helping children, student exchange and cultural programs abroad. I was a student abroad myself, and I feel it's so important for people of other countries to get to know each other. So many things where she cares, she can help. And these are all things which uh, you work on in your present capacity, are they? That's right, I do, yes. And I do a lot of work with mentally retarded children, which has always been a great interest to my husband's family. In American politics, it's an arduous journey to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue for a candidate. How's your husband, how's the senator holding up physically? Is he getting enough sleep? How does he keep fit? He looks wonderful. Well, he doesn't get enough sleep. When I joined him in two days in New York, we had four hours sleep last uh, each night, and he had two bowls of soup each day. He doesn't sleep, he doesn't eat, he doesn't do anything to keep fit, but he thrives on it. That's what keeps him fit. And so he amazes me. He looks wonderful, I think. I wish I knew the secret. <laughs> Mrs. Kennedy, what does your daughter, Caroline, think of all that's going on around her these days? Well, I try to keep it so that Caroline thinks her father is no different from any other father in this block. It's slightly difficult because every other father isn't in Alaska one day and California the next. And she saw someone with a Kennedy button the other day and was amazed to see them wearing a picture of Daddy. But she thought it was completely natural that she loved her father so much everyone should wear his picture. <laughs> but would you like to see her? Oh, I'd like to very much. Are you sure it's all right for us to intrude on the young lady? Well, we'll see, Mr. Charles. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> hello, Caroline. Can you say hello? Here, want to sit up in the bed with me? Oh, isn't she a darling? And look, look at our three bears. Mommy, I want to go in there. All right. What's this dolly's name? I didn't name her yet. You didn't name her yet? No. When are you going to name her? Is that her favorite? Her, her favorite as of this minute. Oh. She's Does just she, like all little girls. She doesn't, what do you think you'll name her tomorrow? She, look at her, what color are her shoes? White, white one. Like yours, what color is her dress? And why does she have a hat on? Because that's because the wind blows the way she takes it off. So she has to have that the wind. I didn't quite get that. But. She has to have a hat on because the wind blows her hair. Oh. Caroline, you're a very, very pretty little girl. And I should think, Mrs. Kennedy, that the proud father would get mighty lonesome for her when he's out on the campaign trail. Well, I think he does. And we'll go down and join him now. Oh, that'll be a treat for him. Should we go see Daddy? Yes. And have him take us to the park? Yes. Go down and sit with Daddy? Yes. All right, let's go see Daddy. Thank you, Mrs. Kennedy. We'll be seeing you in a little while, Carolyn. Hello, Senator Kennedy. Hello, Charles. How are you? Pretty well, thank you. We've been having a very pleasant visit with your ladies. Very good. They're good company. I know you've had to be away from them for more than you like for a good many months now, but I don't suppose a successful politician can be one without giving up something of his personal life, can he? No, I ran in seven primaries this winter, and now, of course, we have engaged in a great contest this fall so that uh, we'll know in November what the future holds for our public and personal life. Politics is a tremendous challenge. Was it family tradition that made you take up that challenge? Well, there was the war, and uh, I also uh, grew up in a family atmosphere, as you suggest. My father was active in the Roosevelt administration, my grandfather in Congress, another grandfather in the state Senate, so that was the family conversation was always around public affairs. And when the war ended, I was at loose ends and, of course, vitally concerned about the United States. And I had an opportunity to run, and I ran, and uh, that's 14 years ago. And I must say, I think it is the most rewarding of all professions. Did you always want to go into politics, or as a boy, did you ever want to be a fireman or a streetcar conductor or something like that? Well, I never wanted to be in politics uh, until uh, really uh, 
almost the time I ran. I was always interested in uh, writing. I wanted to teach for a while. And uh, then I thought maybe I'd work in the government in some career service. So that really the war changed my life and uh, I suppose if it hadn't been for that and what happened then, I don't suppose, I suppose I would have gone on with my original plans. Changed a lot of people's lives. When did you decide you wanted uh, to run for the presidency, Senator? Well, after 1956, I was a candidate for the vice presidency against Estes Kefauver, but he beat me by about 20 votes at the convention. And then after the Democrats lost in 56, I began to think that maybe I would run in 1960 and began to work weekends traveling around the United States and finally decided in 58 that I would run, 59, and then I chose the primary route. So it's been a long and arduous uh, four years. It has indeed. Who were some of your teachers in the fine art of politics? And what special lessons did you learn from them? Experience is the uh, best teacher in uh, all these matters. But uh, my father was uh, always active in political life. My grandfather, I spent an awful lot of time with him when I was young. And then uh, observation. Mm. I think politics has changed a good deal since the Second War. The issues are very uh, sophisticated now and complex, and the style has changed. My grandfather was uh, successful, but uh, and he uh, was really the more traditional type of uh, political leader. That's your grandfather, Fitzgerald. That's right. Then he, he was a sort of flamboyant politician, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he was really had a, I suppose in some ways he was more equipped for it than I was, at least one phase of it. But that uh, style has changed now. Now the problems are terribly important. Everyone in the United States is concerned with what happens in government life, and therefore, I think uh, what they're interested in is uh, work, and results, and not so much interested in the old style uh, campaigning and the old style public personalities. Do you like it better this way? What well, happens to suit me better. What do you like most about this great and serious business of politics? Well, I think everyone uh, has strong feelings about what we ought to do in foreign affairs and domestic affairs. Well, now, I've been on the Labor Committee and Public Welfare Committee for 14 years, and I'm now on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In fact, I'm chairman of the subcommittee on Africa of the Foreign Relations Committee. Well, I think that any American who has a strong desire to see his country uh, prosper and be at peace, we have a chance to do something about it. Maybe it's marginal, maybe it's direct. But uh, at least uh, we play a role. I was on the Rackets Committee for three years in the Senate. I think we made it uncomfortable for a good many racketeers. We made it uncomfortable for Jimmy Hoffer and some of the others. So we have a chance to put uh, our interest and concern and bring some results from it. Let me turn that question around. What are the things about politics that you like the least? Well, I suppose uh, it's, I'm away from home a lot. The, uh, and it's exhausting work, and uh, but I, I and it's uh, it's a terribly uh, involved and uh, life and the pressures are tremendous and the responsibilities are great. I'm the standard bearer for the oldest political party in the United States and one of the oldest in the world now. Now that's a great responsibility. I like to feel that I can meet it, but it, the pressure is tremendous. And of course, the higher you rise, the pressures and responsibilities mount with them. So I carry heavy burdens right now. What suggestions would you have for youngsters who would like to go into politics? Well, the way to uh, go in is to go in. I would uh, feel that uh, any young boy or girl, and the age really, they can begin at an early age. And uh, in fact, when I ran for the Senate in 1952, we had the help of a good many boys and girls, 13, 14, 15, 16, or 17. The fact is that 90% of the tasks in politics can be done by anyone from 15 to 80. And that is writing letters, doing telephoning, working at headquarters, delivering material, ringing doorbells. Poly uh, young people, women, men, older people can do that just as well as the most skilled politician. And uh, in fact, in many cases, are willing to do it when politicians are not. So I would say the time to participate is any time. Have you ever thought, Senator, what you might have liked to do if you hadn't gone into politics, besides practicing law and teaching, as, writing, as you suggested? No, earlier. I think that uh, I would have done one of those uh, professions or worked in the government in some career service, maybe in the uh, State Department or in some... Uh, I would have gone into some kind of public uh, work, public service, but uh, I'm delighted that I was able to do it this way. Would it take a, a major speech 
to have you tell us what you consider the principal qualities of political leadership? No, I think that uh, the principal qualities is to have some vision into the future about what you want uh, this country to do and then have an ability to communicate that vision or that, uh, those goals. I think that uh, Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt did that particularly well. They set the public interest uh, before the people, the unfinished business. Actually, only the president can do that. I'm really just a senator from Massachusetts, and other senators represent their states, and governors do, and congressmen. But the president represents Massachusetts, California, and Hawaii. He, therefore, at the center of our constitutional system, the leader of, a, of the majority party, the leader of the country, is able to uh, make a judgment as to what the country must do, what the public interest requires, and then, I think, ask the people to do it. And I don't think the people have ever failed to respond to that kind of leadership. Well, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty uh, important recipe which you've just outlined. What do you think are the qualities in a president which makes him a great president? Well, I think that, uh, of course, great times make great presidents and great men. That uh, is, is, is a factor. Uh, Washington, Lincoln, uh, Wilson, Roosevelt, uh, I think that though they lived in times of crisis and met the crisis. In addition, I would say vitality. Theodore Roosevelt had that, so did Jefferson. A sense of the future and the past, and a wide cultural uh, experience, which makes it possible for them to draw on the uh, lives of other men and the uh, experiences of other men that will apply it to a particular situation. Moral courage, a sense of the future, a sense of the past, physical vitality, intellectual vitality, intellectual curiosity, and purpose. I would say those are the qualities. Now you spoke of uh, the background, the wide cultural background. You had that, of course, uh, and you also grew up under rather favored circumstances. What uh, was it in your early life that led you to take the social stands that you've taken and that you're running on now? How did your social conscience develop? Well, I represented at the end of the, uh, when I first went into Congress in 1946, I represented a district that was very poor in Massachusetts. My grandfather had represented it 50 years before. My father had come out of that district and so had my mother. The, uh, we had many problems, housing, many families were in need of assistance. I think that the experience of representing and therefore working for people, first in that district for six years, then in Massachusetts, I think that as you become the representative of the people, their spokesman, it seems to me that you have to recognize that there is an obligation to help people who uh, either because they need good schools if they're young or because they're sick when they're old, because their housing is inadequate, that need uh, assistance. And therefore, my uh, viewpoint on the necessity for social legislation came really pragmatically through just observation. I think it's the only way that you can maintain a free society is to meet the needs of the people, provide an atmosphere where the economy can function and also meet the needs of the people. During this campaign, Senator, you've spoken a good deal about your vision of America, what you think America stands for, what you want it to do. Do you feel that you're getting a response from the people who are listening to you to that line? Yes, I think there's a tremendous idealistic concept of the United States held by Americans. Theodore Roosevelt struck the note and so did Woodrow Wilson, especially at the beginning of this century. And we've had it uh, ever since. I think there's a strong devotion to this country, a strong sense of public purpose by the American people. And I think that they're concerned with that our generation maintains uh, the uh, power and influence of the United States. It isn't really just our country. We also serve the cause of freedom, and if we do well, the cause of freedom prospers, because we carry that uh, banner. Communists carry another banner, hostile to us. If their society moves and ours stands still, they serve their cause. I want our cause to be served, and I think only the United States can serve it at this particular time in history. And I think the American people feel that. Senator Kennedy, I remember that uh, you suffered during the primaries, and I think not too long ago, about the worst ill that can befall a candidate when you lost your voice during uh, the campaign. How did that happen, and what can you do to uh, prevent an occurrence of it? 
Well, I suppose the human voice isn't meant to shout around the hills of West Virginia or in the plains of Wisconsin month after month, 9, 10, 15 times a day, so that the sooner or later it gave out, but probably that's just nature's way of telling you you've talked too much. <laughs> that, uh, do, do the doctors think that it's going no, to be I a... guess we're all right, but it's hard work, but uh, silence won't bother the country if I lose it again for a few days. I have my daughter here. Oh, there's Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Daddy, to read you a story? Thank you. Come on over here. Sit on this. Give these books to him, all right. Which one do you want him to read? That one. That one? What's that one? That looks like a good one. What's the name of that That's book? That's Turkish Fairy Tales. Do you want to come up here and read it? Thank you. Mrs. Kennedy, uh, Senator, your family is going to increase uh, very shortly. Have you given any thought to uh, uh, what you're going to do about the nursery and that sort of thing? Well, it's pink now, so uh, I might have to change the color a little. But I think because I'm talking on television, <laughs> I think it's a great mistake to set your mind that you want either a girl or a boy because it's so unfair to the baby. I'll be delighted with whatever I have. Have you got any names picked out? Well, if it's a son, I think he should be named after his father. And a girl, I'll decide when I see her. How does that fit with you, Senator? Well, that's fine. I don't take it off? Boy or girl, very good. <laughs> we have a girl, I just soon have another one. Well, you've got an awful nice one there. Would Daddy read it? <laughs> Would Daddy read it? Would you read it, Daddy? Well, if you want the one Senator the and Mrs. Kennedy, it's been very good of you to let us come by and call on you today. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a great pleasure, Charles. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Caroline. Which one do you want? 